Good morning, Germany. Good afternoon, Cambodia. It's a pleasure for me. My name is Alfred Mayer. I am the, the managing director of the environmental cluster Bavaria located here in Augsburg. And uh, we are very happy to be part of the Waste Summit 2021 here in Cambodia uh, with a, from my point of view, a very uh, inspiring uh, topic the innovator role of technologies in waste management as a way forward to sustainable development. This means uh, we have a lot of interesting uh, uh, presentations today, uh, all very closely linked to that topic. And uh, we are very happy to moderate uh, the, this afternoon session. Uh, we means, uh, myself and uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Eva Schichel, who, who is going to moderate the different presentations uh, uh, afterwards. Yeah, first of all, many thanks uh, to, to our uh, partners, uh, especially the GIZ. We, we have a very uh, fruitful connection with such organizations and uh, many thanks to all other partners. And as I learned uh, during the last two days, it's a very fruitful and a very inspiring session organized here in Phnom Penh. And we are very happy to have the opportunity to moderate such an, a crucial topic today. And just some words to the environmental cluster. We are a network of around about 230 members here in Bavaria. Uh, and our main tasks are to uh, bring on forward the competitiveness of our members in all core disciplines of environmental technology. And of course, waste management is one of our essential part. We uh, are uh, doing a lot of projects here. And I'm very interesting uh, to learn much more about uh, uh, the very, in uh, very interesting and inspiring topics our presenters uh, will introduce in the next, next minutes. And uh, thanks a lot for all to, that you're joining our session today. And now I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Eva Schechel, who is going to moderate the session during this afternoon. Eva, it's up to you. Thanks a lot for all and get inspired. We have a lot to do in the world in the future. Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you for your welcoming words, Alfred. Uh, it's always very inspiring. Um, yeah, good afternoon to Cambodia and uh, good morning to everyone from joining us from Germany as well. From my side, my name is Dr. Eva Schichel. I'm a project manager at Umwelt Cluster Bayern. And I will be taking you through today's session um, on waste prevention which I think is obviously a very important topic and I'm really happy to do this today. Um, so we have some very special guests uh, today and we will hear about um, great examples uh, from all kinds of perspectives and all kinds of sectors um, about waste prevention and uh, on, on yeah, very uh, one of the first very special perspective I think is um, that of cities and municipalities. So without further ado, I would like uh, to introduce Karina uh, Koop as our first speaker. Karina um, is a researcher at the Wuppertal Institute and uh, yeah, coordinated the first zero waste city project in Germany, which is um, the city of Kiel actually, and um, also is now coordinating um, the project of zero waste in Munich. And yeah, we are very pleased to hear um, about zero waste cities, Karina, and yeah, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will start sharing my screen. Second. Perfect, thank you. Uh -huh. And now. All right. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Karina Koop. I'm a researcher at the Wuppertal Institute. That's the Research Institute for Climate, Energy and Environment in Germany. 
and I'm working in the circular economy unit and my research focused on the potential of the circular, uh, circular economy for the municipal level. And like Eva already mentioned, I am focused on the zero waste approach. And today I'd like to give you an insight into our research project where we developed the zero waste strategies for the German cities Kiel and also I'd like to give you a little insight into Munich. And uh, yeah, but before starting with our project, I'd like to give you a little um, definition what is really meant by zero waste. Because often I heard when uh, talking about this project, zero waste, that's not possible. But it's not about that a city is really having absolutely no waste. It's about finding a way of reducing the waste significantly in one city, especially the one that can't be recycled or composted. And here you can see the definition uh, of zero waste by the Zero Waste International Alliance. And it's about the conservation of all resources through the responsible consumption, sustainable production, and the reuse and recovery of the product. So it should be without burning and with no discharges to land, water, or air that treat the environment or human health. It's uh, also focusing on the waste pyramid, like probably most of you know, and but it's focused on the first three stages. So to prevent the waste, to reuse and to recycle. But uh, the waste incineration or landfill should be kept really to a absolutely um, minimum level. So like the sentence, the best waste is the one that is never created. <laughs> and behind the zero waste, City approach, there is the Zero Waste International Alliance. Um, this is an alliance including over 60 organizations worldwide working towards zero waste. And the majority of these um, different uh, organizations is located in Europe and North America, but there are also two um, organizations part of the, this alliance is located in Asia. And probably the most well-known or famous uh, example of an uh, international zero waste city is San Francisco, like you can see here. But I will focus today on the European um, zero waste cities. And in Europe, um, this is coordinated by Zero Waste Europe. That's a network where up to now almost 400 municipalities across Europe are part of it. And Kiel is the first city in Germany. And if you like to become a zero waste city, um, a zero waste concept must be developed. And this concept has three overarching goals. First of all, to reduce the total amount of waste in the city, then to reduce the residual waste, so the one that goes into incineration or to landfill. And the third goal, to raise the awareness for the topic of zero waste, so that all the citizens, all the businesses and the city also know about and really live this zero waste approach. Of course, there are also a lot of guidelines to get the certification. And I just put maybe the three most important ones here, so that the city needs to define really quantitative goals to so to which year they want to decrease the uh, amount of waste up to uh, so on, uh, that many presented. Then they need to publish really annual progress reports and milestones so that and to really publish them uh, so that everybody can see it and know about how about the progresses and the establishment of a zero waste advisory board, meaning an advisory board that is um, includes different persons from the, the city. So from the, uh, from the construction and building sector, from the city administration, from the educational, from businesses. So they, they are really supporting and uh, the development and the implementation of this zero waste concept. And yet to put it together, it, um, it is really a holistic uh, approach to zero waste concept. So meaning that really all parts of the city needs to work together and uh, yet to cooperate and find ways how they in their own area can reduce waste and how they can work together. So that uh, the waste management, the households, the industry, retail and events, the education, the public administration will be working together. And to maybe get a little impression, I um, brought some good practices. So in 
which direction is the waste approaches from the industry and retail uh, as one exemplary um, sector I brought here. So first of all, um, a company called Lorenz Water Meter. Um, they are producer of water meters. And uh, yeah, in Germany, we got a law that the water meters needs to be replaced regularly. And, and no matter if they're working perfectly or not, they need to be replaced. And this is a bit of background of the idea of this company because they are producing the water meters, but they are really high. Um, some years ago, there were really high price fluctuations from the raw material they needed to produce. And they thought about first changing this raw material, but because this one is the best one for their project, uh, they got another idea. And now they are taking back the old one and remanufacture them. And now they got a uh, really could reduce the demand for newer materials by 30%. Their material savings are higher than the new personal cost that they have. So that uh, would be really a win-win situation. Maybe the second example, probably known by some, the Kandlenborg Industrial Park in Denmark. So this is really an, an industrial symbiosis because nine companies from different uh, industries working here together from the chemistry, from the pharmaceutical, from the construction sector. And the, here, the residual material from one company is uh, used by the next one. So, and because of that, they could save the raw materials, they could save a lot of water, uh, waste, and also CO2 emissions. And that means that they also have financial incentives. The third example is a bit different one. Uh, it's a zero waste street in Paris. That was a one year experiment. And on this street, um, all residents uh, who are living there, this is over 6,000, all the businesses, shops, restaurants, schools uh, who are located in the streets work together to reduce the waste. And they, are, um, they got, for example, discounts for reusable boxes and containers, but they also got a really lot of consultation and workshops for the schools and the businesses. And in just half a year, they could reduce the waste by 16%, just working together and really everyone uh, did something. Yeah, and uh, after this first example, um, to make the waste a bit more tangible, I'd like to tell about our project, how we um, helped to make Kiel the first German zero waste city. And Kiel, <laughs> that's the city in the northern part of Germany, it's like, uh, located directly at the coast, and it has 250,000 inhabitants, so not one of the biggest cities in Germany. And, and for this project, it was um, done about the city administration here and more concrete the environmental protection department. And the project was about one year and we finished uh, the zoo waste concept in August last year. And the background was quite nice because the idea that Kiel should be the first new waste city in Germany was came really directly from the civil society. So there was the zero waste Kiel Association located in uh, Kiel or working there since a few years and they organized a really big event. They invited experts uh, from worldwide and they uh, suggested the idea to the city municipality if she, Kiel should become the first uh, the UA city in Germany. And yeah, that work, worked out and the um, municipal council uh, decided after that that uh, Kiel should go this way. Um, yeah, and then we started with our project together uh, with two project partners and developed the zero waste concept, which is the basis for the certification. And here I'd like to show you the project structure. So how we started uh, or what we did to, uh, to reach the zero waste strategy. And it's based on four pillars. So first of all, we started with the status quo analysis. We did the participation. Uh, we developed um, a catalog of objectives and uh, measures. And uh, after that, we also made some scenarios for the waste volume. And looking a bit more detail into this, at the status quo analysis, we looked first of all at the waste sector in Kiel. So, um, uh, 
how much waste do they have? So how much residual waste, how much recyclables is there? How high are the recycling rates? How much waste goes into incineration? To really have a picture where Kiel is starting from. After that, we uh, also looked at the existing new waste activities. So who in Kiel is already active? Who are the multiplayers? And who are the ones that are creating most of the waste? And um, afterwards, we also looked at good practice examples. Um, so what is not done in Kiel, but what could be uh, inspiring examples from other cities that could work for Kiel. In the participation, we looked first of all, uh, who are the key players in, 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 in Kiel and the zero waste approach. So we see who can we talk, who is important to get part of the project. And then we did a round of workshops uh, with different uh, sectors of the city to really um, create or collect new ideas for waste prevention in Kiel. After this workshop, we had really a lot of ideas. And after that, we structured and bundled them. We evaluated the measures. And we also made a discussion which should be the objectives and with which measures can we reach these objectives. After that, in the scenarios for the waste volumes, we created two scenarios. Uh, the first is the business as usual scenario. So we're looking at how does the waste volumes develop in the future when Kiel goes on with the current path. And in comparison to the waste scenario, so when all the measures are implemented, how can the waste volumes decrease? And put all this together uh, into the zero waste strategy. And now I'd like to, to look at some parts in more detail. Um, first of all, the collection of measures. The status quo analysis uh, was quite impressive because there were already uh, over 70 uh, new waste activities in Kiel. So for example, they had the first unpackaged store in Germany there. They got a lot of repair cafes. They got uh, different systems for reusable uh, cups. They got um, a new waste space um, that is a, a building uh, that shows how um, waste can be prevented in the building sector. They got the Zero Waste Kiel Association, who are offering workshops, consulting zero waste events, uh, offering regular tables, and also the University of Kiel has its own um, waste prevention um, concept with a quite, uh, quite great effort. Next one was this good practice analysis. So looking at other cities, what they have. They also, we had uh, over 100 ideas that could work for Kiel and our workshops where we got over 600 ideas from the Kiel residents. And uh, here you can see some pictures of the workshop that we done. And all in all, we did four different workshops. We did one with the munic municipal sector. So with the, um, local um, local policy and also the public administration uh, discussing with them what are really the problems, what can they do here um, to prevent waste in Kiel. Then we also talked with the business and events, we talked with households, schools um, and initiatives and also with the waste management. So the private and also the public waste management and also the large housing estate. And um, after that, we also got one workshop to develop objectives and prioritize measures because we said Kiel or the residents should not only uh, help to, um, to develop these measures, but they also should um, uh, tell us how their visions of the city should look like so that they should also help to uh, create these objectives. And all in all, it was really great interested in this topic. Um, during that time, we could do it all in person and over 450 residents participated in, those, in these different workshops. And from these really a lot of ideas that we got, um, we tried to create this catalog of measures now. And there, of course, we uh, structured and bundled the ideas, put similars together, deselected some ideas, and then we um, 
sorted it uh, for the different sectors and looked at maybe is there is, are there some gaps do we maybe have don't have enough measures for the event sector then we added them from the good practice list then we also did a scientific evaluation so we looked at the cost of the measures the potential to really prevent the waste and the feasibility to um for key for these measures and after this process uh, we got a list of 100 measures for key and to give you a little um uh, insight into these measures i um put here some examples so in the educational um sector for example kiel has the establishment of zero waste schools meaning that um this is our this is a certification for schools and uh, they can get it for example when they got waste-free canteens when they make school lessons on uh, also on waste prevention that the procurement in the schools is also based on zero waste and uh, so that the really the waste prevention is on all stages of the school um, for the household sector, um, we decided a uh, zero waste culture house. Um, so that was also a wish from the uh, from the civil society that uh, there should be a, a place in the city where activities for reuse, for repair, uh, for sharing are spatially bundled in a building where they can really um, share ideas and uh, also use these different activities. And the event sectors, we got a, the establishment of a rental system where also um, private but public um, events can uh, rent uh, a lot of equipment. Um, in the industry, there's the establishment of a center for the reuse of building components. In the public administration, there's a new waste guide for the public procurement. And the waste management, there is a examination though it's not completely they examined it before the payers just throw the same in combination with waste charges based on the polluter pace principle so meaning that there's really a financial incentive to uh, produce less waste so that you just pay the waste that you also generate and in retail for example also that there should be discounts for bringing your own reusable container and like I told you, not only measures need to be um, developed in this zero waste approach, uh, also objectives are needed. And we created together with the city of Kiel two objectives for the entire city of Kiel and also 18 sub objectives. And the first objective is that the amount of waste per capita per year in Kiel should be reduced by 15% by 2035. And uh, the second one uh, focused on the residual waste, especially that this one should be halved by 2035 and in the long term should be even less than 50 kilograms per capita. So really quite ambition um, objectives, but um, to look if, if, it's all, if it's still possible to reach these goals, we created the zero waste scenario to uh, here you can see in the red line that's the business as usual scenario so when Kiel goes on with their current path and in comparison the zero waste scenario so when Kiel will um, implement the different measures that we um, created um, how can they reduce the waste and there you can see that uh, until 2050 it is really possible to reduce the residual waste by 70 percent so it is possible <laughs> and yeah maybe last the uh, lessons learned and further steps uh, so further steps and um, after the two project after the um, project ended for us um, for Kiel it just started so they need to start to implement all the different measures um, they uh, the the Kiel council adapted to this the waste concept as a municipal roadmap was an important step for the city administration that they really focus on this concept now and in spring this year they also are now in the certification process so they are real zero waste candidate cities yeah, and the lessons learned for us really important to involve the citizens from the beginning because we can't decide as researchers uh, who are not living in the city what they should do so we really recognize that it's so important to, to get the ones who are living there because they are the ones 
where it should be implemented and they should help. Um, the next uh, lessons learned for us was to, to really honor the active initiatives and stakeholders um, because they are working on uh, waste prevention uh, since the last years and um, they are really important stakeholders to, to implement everything there. And um, yeah, the next one really involves all sectors of the city. So it can't work when only the city administration is, is doing waste prevention measures. It's important that also the education, the businesses, everybody is working on that and those that they can um, collectivity reach this goal of the waste city. And uh, yeah, the next is that Kiel is really, was a really role model for other German cities because after Kiel um, uh, finalized the, the waste concept, a lot of other cities are now in this process that they also uh, like to become a zero waste city. So for example, currently we are working on zero waste Munich. So a much bigger city in Germany with over 1 million inhabitants and um, other cities like Regensburg, Cologne will start soon. So it was, it really had a high impact that one city, one city in Germany really started this process and the others can see, okay, it can work. We can also go on. And that's, I think, really important because the more cities try to reduce the waste, the better. It, I think it doesn't have to be this zero waste approach. There are other approaches, um, but it's important that the cities really, or one city is starting this process. Yeah. And uh, therefore, I would say thank you very much for your attention. Um, for free for questions, but I think we will do the questions after all the uh, different presentations. Thank you, Karina, for your insights. That was very insightful, definitely. Um, well, I want to pick up one question um, right now because I think uh, it's getting a bit more communicative uh, in between sessions and just a very short one and a very short answer. So, what do you think? What would be the one thing you would recommend for a city who wants to start that, that process, that journey towards a zero waste city? What's the most important thing to, to take care of to make this pro progress work? Yeah, maybe to um, maybe talk to other cities who all already did this process um, to, so, um, to get a really better insight what were the problems or for the municipal, uh, municipality. And then it's, it's, I think it depends a bit of if, they're, um, if the idea is coming from the civil society or the municipality, both is working, I can tell. Um, so in Munich, it was the other way around that the municipality or the major had the idea, but uh, it could also work. Um, I think it's important just to start and about the zero waste um, alliances, you can get a lot of information and a lot of help when you like to start with this process. Perfect. Thank you so much for that for that answer. And yeah, anyone who's interested in, in more details from uh, Karina's presentation, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we definitely pick you up or pick them up in, at the end of the, the overall session. So thank you, Karina. And so I want to introduce the next person on our panel, which is uh, Christina Ruiz Duran from the uh, German Sustainable Building Council. Um, we are super happy, happy to have you here today. So she's a project manager for research project with a focus on circular economy uh, at the Sustainable Building Council. And yeah, um, she will give us her insights on how waste can be prevented in the construction sector. I think one of the most waste intensive sectors of all, as far as I'm informed. And why a circular instead of a linear economy is the key to prevent that waste. Christine. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my screen and hear me well. Yes, both perfect. Yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak at today's uh, summit and uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to speak today about how we can uh, apply the concept of a circular economy in the construction sector. 
Um, first of all, I would like to shortly present the organization. I'm coming from the DGB as the German Sustainable Building Council. Um, the DGB is a nonprofit organization from Stuttgart in Germany, um, and it has been promoting a sustainable built environment since its foundation in 2007. Um, and we do that in a different uh, kind of way. So we're a nonprofit organization. We work very closely with our network of more than um, 1,300 member organizations. Um, we provide a certification system for sustainable buildings and uh, districts um, and interiors for every kind of building actually, um, which aims really at translating sustainability aspects into practice and make them measurable. And then also as a third column, we provide expert knowledge on sustainable construction and also on the topic of circular economy through our DGMB Academy. So coming to what a, circ uh, what a circular economy is, uh, we are still currently living in a very linear economy in terms of the general economy, but also and especially in the construction sector. So what we do is we take finite resources from the environment, we make goods out of them, which we use for a very, very li limited period of time, sometimes just for single use, um, and then we dispose of them at the end of life, even if they are still functional. And I think we all know that resources are finite and then we cannot go on with this linear system forever. Um, it is not going to function in the long term and it is not designed for sustainable growth and also not for scaling. So instead, what we actually need is a sustainable, in order to create a sustainable future, is to establish a circular economy. This means that we have to focus really on preserving the quality of the resources and, and maintaining the value of the, the resources we have already extracted from the environment at the highest level possible. So instead of disposing um, of the resources or of the buildings of every resource we have um, after a single use, what we should do is try to reuse it and repair it and recycle it uh, and maintain them in circulation. So the problem about this is that usually um, for us at the end of the life cycle, resources are considered as waste. Um, it's, we consider it as something to be disposed of. Um, and if we put it to the waste to landfill or if we incinerate it, uh, actually all value gets lost. If we incinerate it, we can get some energy, <laughs> create some energy out of it, but still afterwards, uh, all the value we have once it's extracted is lost. And um, if we export, um, our waste to other countries, for example, for our market, also valuable resources get lost because we just see it as a waste. So actually it would be, what we need is a change of perspective uh, and really understand that the waste streams are actually not waste, but they are something valuable and that they can be the basis for new products. So it's really important to use what has already been produced once um, instead of extracting new resources. And this is especially certain for the construction sector. Um, you, uh, Eva has just said it that uh, in Germany, uh, the, the waste streams uh, are quite high and the construction and demolition waste is actually more than half of the waste stream of all German waste streams. So it's really a, a crucial sector. So we have to move away from this mindset that uh, a building becomes waste at the end of life. Um, so applying this to the construction sector, we can no longer think construction in, in such a linear way. Um, just start at the design phase, then the use phase, and at the end of life, we just deconstruct the building. So what we need instead is really a holistic uh, life cycle approach and understand that a building that at the end of life, a building is actually beginning uh, a new life cycle and we can prolongate the life of a building. So um, at DGMB, we have been dealing very intensively with this, these aspects of circular economy, um, especially in the last years. And uh, we have put together five starting points we have named it for the implementation of circular economy in the construction sector. So first of all, the best thing we can actually do is to preserve existing buildings whenever possible. Um, we cannot, as we have done before in the past, just deconstruct a building uh, at the end of life and start fresh by building a new building. So uh, in the whole discussion on circular economy, sometimes we just say, okay, from now on, we are doing everything right. But we ha actually have already a lot of the buildings that will be in our built environment in 20, 30, 50 years. So we actually have to know how we can deal with what is already there. 
uh, and we should rather try to use what is already there, preserve the buildings uh, and try to renovate them or maybe uh, find a new use for it when the one first life cycle is over instead of deconstructing buildings and let them become waste. So the preser preservation is actually what allows us to maintain the highest possible value of the resources in the built environment. Um, of course, this is not always possible, and sometimes it's also not uh, environmentally uh, 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 meaningful, so we should always really look at the certain project, and in case we cannot preserve the whole building, or if you cannot adapt it to a new use, we can still understand it um, as a source of raw materials. So um, in Germany, another number from Germany, the building stock comprises more than 52 billion tons of material, so there are a lot of materials that we can actually use um, instead of disposing of them and making them become waste. Um, so we, what we should do is take the materials out of the building stock and integrate them into the new design uh, of a new building. So for example, we can take out bricks, windows, doors, whatever is still functional and can be um, dismantled should not be disposed of. And this, this uh, concept is described also as uh, in the terms of urban mining, um, which comprises really our living space and our built environment as a new source of raw materials and really aims at extracting everything that's valuable from it. So on the one hand, we have seen that we have a devaluation of our raw materials because we, in our thinking, they become waste at the end of life. And at the other, on the other hand, we have a very, very valuable materials and resources that are already uh, in the in the building stock and that can be used for new construction. So uh, when it is really necessary and it comes to the deconstruction of buildings, uh, it is really crucial to establish um, efficient processes to bring this material uh, back into the cycle. Um, really to make it possible to match the supply that comes out of one deconstruction project um, and the demand for, uh, for new materials or for, for recycled materials for new construction projects. So, um, aiming at maintaining the highest possible value of the resources. In order to do that, it is really crucial to separate the different waste streams at the source. So on, it can be on the construction side, uh, on the deconstruction side, but also on the new construction side. The best thing we can do is always to, to se really separate the different source, uh, waste uh, streams at the source and manage them separately. So it's really important to avoid the mixing of the different materials, especially um, of hazardous materials, because uh, mixing them up with the other materials really prevents a future reuse and recycling. So um, at DGMB, we have really been um, putting a focus on fostering this development and um, getting more transparency into the, into the deconstruction um, aspect of the buildings, because as I said before, we usually only look at how can we do everything better in the future and new construction, but uh, we have to really optimize the processes of the deconstruction of buildings. So it's really necessary to create transparency and um, know what is it there at the end of, of our lifetime uh, and what resources are there and how can we secure their value and maintain it uh, high. So um, our deconstruction, we have developed a deconstruction certificate. So now uh, deconstruction projects can actually be um, certified by our organization and this really helps to, to optimize the reuse and the recycling path uh, and avoid disposal at the end of life. And one as important focus is also on handling hazardous substances and separate them from the rest. So um, in the design phase of a new construction, um, we, we can, when we start then with a new construction, obviously it's necessary to really reuse the materials uh, and components and also to, to, to get the awareness that they are not waste, it's not less uh, uh, material of less value, but that we can really um, consider at every point uh, when materials really do have to be taken from raw, primary raw materials or whether they can be gathered from the urban mine or the building stock. So here also awareness should, uh, be, be, be um, yeah, fostered um, that this is not waste and that secondary building materials are as good as um, those primary raw materials and even better for the environment. Um, and then last but not least, um, 
now when we are looking at the future design. So now we're constructing a, a new construction project and we want to make it better and avoid creating waste for the future. Because what I've been talking until about until now is how to avoid that the actual building stock becomes waste. But of course, we are constantly creating new buildings and um, want to make our, do our best to make the resources available for future use. So uh, it is crucial in order um, to avoid waste to really implement a circular design of a building. So what does that mean? So how do we implement circularity in the phase, uh, design phase of a new construction? Um, a circular design really ensures that buildings are adaptable and flexible for future use. Um, that is, this is really important because we don't know today in which way um, we will possibly use our buildings in 20 or 50 or even more years. Um, we are trying to prolongate the lifetime, so uh, who knows how we will be using buildings uh, at that time. Um, so what we have to do is to design them in a flexible way so that we can change them um, and that we don't have to adapt as, a, as persons, as people to the buildings, but that the buildings can adapt to our way to, uh, to use buildings. And this can happen through flexible layouts, a flexible building structure so that uh, walls can be changed in the future. Um, everything that makes the, the, the layouts flexible can actually um, support an extension of the lifetime of a building. Uh, and another thing that, that can contribute to a lifetime extension is if we really um, at the design phase already think about how can we facilitate repair and maintenance. For example, if we have building technology in a building, um, how can we make it accessible? How can we size uh, the dimensions of the of the um, of the building technology and and the the um, rooms the building technology is actually in in order to make it um, adaptable uh, and repairable for future use? Because we know that building technology is changing quite faster than a building actually changes, um, and then. A really important point is also of a circular building that it aims to reduce complexity. So in the past, actually, the complexity of building design has increased significantly. Um, we have made buildings more and more complex. We have put more different things into it. But along with this complexity um, actually comes a really a reduced adaptability and also a reduced um, ease of recovery at the end of lifetime because we started to stick things together, put everything together, make compounds that are not, se not separable. And we should actually aim to reduce this amount of different materials, of different layers, different joining technologies, and make the building a bit more simple. It's actually not that simple to really uh, implement that, but from the thinking, um, it should really reduce complexity. Um, it can also help, for example, to implement serial formats uh, because we know that serial formats are more easily reusable in the future. If we have bricks, for example, they always have the same size and we know for a future building how we can use these bricks in a, in, in a, um, for a future reuse. Bricks or tiles, every serial format can also help to reduce this complexity. And then when it comes to the, to the material choice, um, it's really uh, important that this is happening um, consciously that we can choose materials that are locally available that do not have to be transported from around the world and um, also if possibly if they are renewable um, if they are not renewable at least if they can be used again in the future so try to um, to 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 use um, high value materials and um, this also includes that we so, um, try to avoid problematic materials and hazardous substances. For example, if we have a wood building, a wooden building, it can, it's per se is renewable uh, and it can be uh, composted, for example, in the future. But if we put a surface treatment and hazardous substances on it, then we prevent actually future recycling. So really be, be careful and conscious about how we treat our materials and how we choose them. And last but not least, uh, really in order to prepare a future reuse and recycling, um, everything in the building should be um, reversible uh, and separable at the end. The joining technologies and connections 
for example, they can um, be bricks without mortar. Um, we can try to avoid adhesive bonding. Um, we can use loose laid carpet tiles instead of sticking them to the floor. So everything that avoids adhesion, inseparable com compounds in order to allow an unmixed recycling and uh, recovery. And this is obviously only a very brief overview here, um, but we have been dealing intensively with this topic and we have collected some more examples of implementation um, in a free report that is downloadable online. So if you're interested, you can of course have a look. It's available in English on our website. And uh, as, as an organization who tries to foster a circular economy, we also integrated this into our certification system, um, really make circular economy measurable um, and accessible. And we provide seminars and digital events um, on this topic. And I would like to close my presentation by highlighting um, the potentials of the circular economy, um, especially of the reuse and recovery. Um, there are obviously very a lot of environmental benefits. First of all, the avoidance of waste, which the panel is actually about, but also se uh, several co-benefits. So we can have a reduction of emissions to air, water and soil. And also um, due to the lesser resource use, we can also uh, reduce our land consumption because we would need less extraction and landfill areas actually. And then there are also economical and social cultural benefits because we really, um, a circular economy on circular construction really helps to, to get more independent from price fluctuations, which can resu result from a lower resource availability. Um, and we can avoid future disposal or landfill costs. Um, in Europe, for instance, these costs will most probably raise significantly in the near future. So it's getting more expensive to create waste. Um, and last but not least, we can create local added value and local jobs in the waste management and recycling um, area. So circular economy seems quite a task to address. And there are still remaining challenges. It's not yet possible to make everything circular, to be honest, but it um, definitely offers a lot of opportunities. And there are many existing solutions. And uh, what Karina has said before, it's really important to start. And every st small step into this direction is really can really make a difference. So we are trying to foster that. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy if there are any questions and you would like to get in touch. Perfect, thank you so much, Christina, for your valuable, valuable insights and my very favorite topic, circular economy. Um, that was really, really cool. Thank you so much. Um, I do have one question uh, from our co-host and co-moderator, Alfred, um, who's asking, uh, what should be the future role of public procurement on the way to more circular economy buildings? I think that's a very interesting, uh, key issue he's he's focusing here. Yeah, I really think so. And we've been actually also uh, deep diving into the topic of, uh, topic of public procurement with the European project right now, um, because the, the, the public procurement really has like the, the uh, how you say that lighthouse role, um, it, it should really, it has a huge um, procurement amount. So uh, they really have a potential to really change something in the built environment. And and allow, um, yeah, be, be a first mover, let's say, be a, be a very good uh, role model. And we're also focusing on that topic and trying to help the sector really to say, okay, you can implement it like this. You have to, in, we have put in together some instruments where you could uh, put the different aspects of circularity, for example, into public procurement in order to really help the stakeholders from the market and from the public procurement sector. Cool, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, any other questions to Christina, please put in the chat and we can pick them up later, hopefully when we have the time. So I would like to pass on the word to Florian Wertmann, who is the founder and CEO of Ecologicon and a member of Umweltklasse Bayern. Very welcome on the stage. Um, he will be talking about waste prevention and reuse in the field of waste of electrical and electronic equipment and batteries. I think also a very, uh, important sector, important um, aspect of, of a waste stream. So please, um, Florian, the stage is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, just let me quickly start to share the 
screen here. I hope everybody is seeing the presentation well. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yep, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, good afternoon to Cambodia. Good morning uh, to Europe and uh, hello to everybody where is ever in the world. My name is Florian Werthmann. Um, I'm here to present on uh, waste prevention and reuse in the field of wind and batteries and I want to point out some general aspects, key facts and uh, potential of reuse um, of electronic devices today. Uh, some short words about Ecologican um, and myself. I'm the founder of Ecologican uh, GmbH. Uh, we're based in Germany. We are a consulting company for circular economy and environmental projects with the main specialization in electronic scrap and producer responsibility solutions. Uh, to move on uh, with the key uh, topic, uh, we first have to look uh, again at the waste hierarchy. The ranking uh, and, and the ranking of prevention and reuse, which uh, has been uh, prevented by Karina, uh, presented by Karina before. So basically, this is the waste pyramid as it should be, or the waste hierarchy as it should be. What we actually uh, see today for the three R's, unfortunately, is the opposite. So it's an upside down waste hierarchy in the world. Um, uh, so reduce and reuse uh, is unfortunately not the most favorable options which are used these days. Um, it's important to incre uh, in, in increase uh, and improve the situation uh, to move from a linear economy into a circular economy. Um, everything starts with a reduction, with a reduce and the prevention of uh, waste. Uh, if that is not possible, uh, the best choice is to go for reuse and reuse itself is part of the prevention activity as well. A major aspect of reusing, uh, especially electronic devices, is repair and refurbishing. So repair, refurbishing and reuse always comes together as part of the circular economy process. Um, both of it, uh, the reduction and prevention, same as reuse and repair, is saving on primary and raw materials. If repair is not possible anymore um, and reuse, therefore, is not possible, uh, materials should be recycled. And from the recycling, we have three pathways out. One is we create secondary, uh, secondary raw materials and uh, use those for new products, or we go for energy recovery or worst case scenario dispose, which should just be a minimum of what's uh, left over. Going towards e-waste and electronic products, the world's rising we challenge, as you can see in the chart, uh, the development of, uh, uh, of uh, the e-waste volumes and the quantities in the world is concerning. Um, uh, that's a UNITA sourced uh, chart, uh, which shows that in 2014, every um, inhabitant of our globe uh, produced 6.4 kg of uh, electronic waste, which amounted to 44 million tons. Uh, recently or currently in 2021, we are expected to hit the 57 million tons range of uh, electronic scrap worldwide. Um, um, and evolving the, uh, with evolving quantities up to 74 plus million tons in the year 2030. So this is a very important topic uh, to be tackled and a very, very important waste stream, which is uh, continuing to grow. Um, wait a second which is continuing to grow. Um, some key points on the development is, uh, number one, we don't foresee a uh, stop of uh, the boom at this moment. Secondly, what we need to keep in mind, if you look at those numbers, most of the devices and items behind those volumes are carrying batteries these days. That's due to mobile communication devices, to e-bikes, toys, home appliances like vacuum bots, tools, and uh, whatever is used. And those batteries are mostly lithium-based rechargeable batteries which are utilized in these days. Looking at the numbers as well, uh, there's a huge potential for reuse and uh, uh, for uh, prevention of uh, waste basically, which is classified at this or calculated at this moment with seven to 20%, equal link to anything in between four and 10 million tons of uh, electronic devices being able to be reused as per today, which is by far not what we achieve worldwide at this moment. What are the reasons for the strong increase of the Wii volumes is um, uh, number one, the biggest driver is a continuing trend to digitalization. Uh, secondly, um, exchange of devices as uh, more and more devices are getting mobilized and downsized. Uh, we're seeing a um, development to or a, a tendency to shorter lifespans of products, 
which is an, uh, enhanced by fast technology developments. Uh, we see decreased price for new electronic items, and uh, we see saving of materials used for production. If you compare an electronic device you bought 20 years ago with today, you, you see it is lighter. It's not, not as uh, strong as it used to be. Another point is uh, strong campaigns. You can see from the OEMs, which are just made to create desire and uh, supposedly need for new and updated items, even though you don't need it. And uh, basically, especially in the developed countries, you see a strong trend to a linear economy and a throwaway society that developed in the last uh, decade. Um, basically, the development of the weak quantities evolved true to the rule. If you consume a lot, you make a lot of waste. And this is what we basically see today before we can, uh, before we um, 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 uh, reuse, we just prefer to buy the new up-to-date version. We need to keep in mind, it is sometimes sensible to replace outdated devices, especially if they uh, don't have a good energy balance anymore, which is a big uh, change or an important aspect uh, to consider in the whole sector. But anyways, what you should do before you satisfy the desire or the demand uh, to get the latest product update, the main question is really, is that new product needed? Is that latest update needed? Or can I just reuse the device I have, even though, even though this is sometimes um, not as easy due to communication, marketing um, campaigns and activities of the OEMs. If you look at electronic devices and raw materials, what's behind those electronic devices, um, you see that a high range or a high percentage of more than 50% is metals like ferrous metals, iron, copper composites, non-ferrous ferrous metals, and a lot of plastics, which uh, main target of us should be to preserve those materials and uh, save on those materials. Um, today, the we recycling in Germany and Europe already makes a significant contribution to conserving resources, uh, which is uh, based on material recycling, which should be the step after reuse uh, is not possible anymore. Besides of the valuable components uh, in, uh, and, and raw materials and resources in electronic items, we find a lot of hazardous components as well, which is one more reason for reuse and proper re-recycling after reuse for those items. So as you can see in the chart on the right side, a lot of daily use household devices, which everybody has in, uh, in, in their homes, uh, do contain a potential or do, potential, do potentially contain uh, hazardous as, uh, the, uh, components and materials like PCB, like asbestos waste, like PVC uh, in virus, uh, or uh, ceramic fibers and other, other materials like that. So the eco-social and raw material potential on reuse, repair and recycling of electronic devices is to prevent the release of those pollutants to the environment is to conserve is the conversation uh, conservation of raw material resources and saving the biodiversity of our planet by not using new primary raw materials is therefore the climate protection and uh, what we need to take into consideration as well most of those materials we are using especially like for example lithium or um, or other raw, raw materials cobalt used for battery production is coming from um, critical areas in the world um, so it's important to to take the responsibility here as well, protect humans in emerging and developing countries from threats to life and health by using those materials. We do create jobs and uh, foster education by reuse and last but not least, by proper treatment, collection, reuse, and not bringing batteries back to the recycling cycle and reuse them, we uh, take a part in fire protection. Basically today, Lithium-ion batteries and cells are one of the major dangers caused by electronic scraps worldwide, as the more scraps we have circulating around, the higher the danger is for fires and explosions by those components. If you look at the role of prevention and reuse in connection with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which have been formulated for 2030, um, we see that we basically meet two target groups, which is number 12, responsible consumption and production, and number eight, which is um, a decent work and economic growth. Target 12.4 is matching, especially with uh, significantly reducing uh, the release to air, water, and soil in order to minimize the adverse impacts on human health and environment concerned on waste. 
um, target 12.5, so substantially reduce waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling, and reuse. And this is where we're going to go for, is like to follow this target and try to prevent and reuse as much uh, devices as possible. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, if you look at target 8.4, um, it is aimed to decouple economic growth from environmental degradation. Therefore, uh, reuse plays an important role. We can still foster economic growth um, and uh, save and preserve the environment. One uh, interesting side fact and something we are, we are um, um, helping to, to improve by not uh, increasing the volumes which are landfilled uh, by reuse and prevention of waste is, for example, that uh, currently 64 million people worldwide live in the 10 kilometer radius of the 50 largest and most completely unsecured landfills. Um, the more materials we put into those landfills, the more uh, uh, danger we put to those um, people in those areas. And uh, that's, I think, an important job to um, uh, tackle this uh, situation. If you look at reuse of electronic items and uh, electronic appliances, uh, the OEM producer uh, plays an important role as well, especially when it comes to design for recycling. Actually, uh, the OEM already sets out the roadmap and the future circularity possibilities of a device when the device is concepted. Um, a, a systematic and comprehensive design approach to especially foster reuse, uh, foster repair in the future is called eco-design of a product. And definitely all steps that advance eco-design, which is designed for repair, designed for recycling, will encourage and uh, optimize the reuse of devices in the future. So the OEM producers uh, do already have, by concepting a device, a very high responsibility for it. Uh, within Europe, from a legal perspective as well, um, this can only be achieved on a European, whole European level. Um, but first, before we look into the uh, more legal aspects, there are still voluntary actions by OEMs with no influence of the European Commission or the European Union. Those are mostly driven by corporate social, corporate green responsibilities or responsibility understanding and or customer demand to implement eco-design. Another tool which is used in Europe to uh, implement eco-design for products with OEMs is uh, the, me uh, the measurement of voluntary agreements, which is mostly driven by the European Commission, giving the freedom to oligopoly characterized industries to self-regulate uh, self themselves, set own eco-design standards, eco-design targets, targets for repar uh, repairability and for end-of-life treatment of their products. But those voluntary agreements must be endorsed by the European Union. And last but not least, if uh, voluntary agreements or voluntary actions of the OEMs do not uh, reach to a certain result, the European Union will, uh, will set out uh, binding design, eco-design directives, uh, which are regulating product design, reusability, repairability, and recyclability. One big example we're currently seeing in Europe at this moment is a unified charging, uh, charging device or regulation for unified chargers for cell phones in the future. As European Union just says, okay, the OEMs are not able to um, uh, to to standardize and and unite on one standard, so we have to do something there. Is this is a big uh, um, point to tackle. The most likely to be re reused and uh, repaired devices and activities today, uh, what we see in the market through um, several uh, initiatives, is uh, mainly B two B hardware from IT areas which are um, recycled. We many times experience um, uh, projects, um, um, uh, inclusion project, uh, projects and cooperations with uh, institutions for disabled people to do so. Uh, we see a lot of OEMs already starting to refurbish and taking back their own device, uh, especially in the sector of medical devices, high-end tools, telecommunication equipment, and IT devices. A lot of companies are popping up, uh, focusing on reprocessing of uh, lease return B2B devices like copier machines, uh, like printers, like servers, uh, et cetera. Um, there's a strong trend to reprocessing of and, and regrading of high-end uh, end-user brands, like, for example, Apple products, what we see. Uh, a long-term proven uh, sector is uh, the refilling industry for printer cartridges, which is 
uh, which has been established since the late 90s worldwide um, and uh, has been a great example for a worldwide organized industrial reusing of electronic devices. Uh, currently, a lot of projects <clears throat> are starting for the repurposing of uh, battery cells, especially car batteries, for a second life of use. So usually the curve is, <clears throat> if you look at a curve of a, um, a lifespan of a battery, uh, it starts with 100%. After six to eight years usage in a car, you are ending up at 85% uh, capacity of that battery, which is not enough to operate as a car battery anymore. But um, you still can use it, for example, to, um, to create a power bank uh, to save um, uh, energy created, uh, electric power created by solar cells uh, until you reach a capacity of 40%. So this is a second life possibility by repurposing car batteries. And we already see a lot of repair shops uh, for household devices coming up or a re repair cafes, which was uh, presented uh, for uh, the measurements in Kiel, for example, as well. If you look at a more legal aspect as well, and the European directives and national legislations within the European unions, uh, Union, you, for, uh, you see two different pathways for electronic devices to get to a reuse. Uh, so everything starts with the initial owner and user who has the electronic device, functional or defective, and that device should end up with the new owner and the new user. So you can either choose the path of product which is the direct reuse, you will never touch the waste regime, or you can choose the path of a waste, uh, which is a waste electronic device, and you will go for preparation of reuse. Um, the one way is, for example, if you go with the path of the product, um, uh, which is um, used many, many times and practiced very well through a lot of online platforms like eBay, Rebuy, etc., is a direct resale to the new user of that device, or you go through a return by, through a dealer, through a retailer, through an OEM. The device usually will be cleaned and tested, will be graded, like the quality will be determined, is there a lot of scratches on there, is it uh, ready to resell it directly, and then sold as a full device or parts to the new owner. If you go through the waste regime, you usually see people disposing their electronic devices as we. Why do they dispose it, use that way? Maybe they're not sure if it's still functional. Maybe it's too complicated for them uh, to, to market it. They are not aware of what they have there or if there's demand and they just want to get rid of it. What's uh, happening at the disposal point for the Wii, which is usually uh, the dealer or the retailer as well, or the municipal collection points, um, it's going to, or at least the first or at latest, the first treatment facility to process the Wii, it will be checked if it's reusable or repairable. If it's a no, we will go for the Wii treatment of that device and uh, recycling measurements will happen to create secondary raw materials. If this is a yes, um, basically the repair activities will start, cleaning starts, testing starts, and if all that um, uh, works uh, properly and the device reaches a certain quality level in the end of the day, it will be sold again as a device or parts as product and we will leave the waste regime at that point. <laughs> Nevertheless, even if we stay in the product regime after cleaning and testing, um, we might end up at a point that the device still has to be disposed as we, because it's just not meeting quality criteria, or even though it's meeting quality criteria, it's going to be stocked and try to sell to be sold, but we find out in the end of the day, there's no demand from the market as people prefer to buy newer date devices, new devices, uh, so this might end up in we scrapping as well. What we identified today is uh, a lot of different obstacles uh, for reuse and repair of devices and items in practice, which is starting uh, with non-repairable design of devices or special tools required. Spare parts is always a uh, big question. Uh, are they available? If you want to repair a product, you need to have the spare part for big household devices. It's usually not so much a problem, but when it comes to small electronic devices, it is a uh, problem. You see some OEM activities 
uh, like blocking of reuse products by firmware activities. Um, a big role is uh, the collection pro is played by the collection process, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, from those uh, bulk collection containers, nobody will reuse anything anymore uh, in the future. We see uh, legal obstacles, um, especially in uh, combination with import and export uh, ban or with the waste regime of the, uh, um, classifications. Sometimes insufficient qualification of reuse facilities and insufficient um, uh, repair uh, attempts, which is just not product-like, to put it that way, or incompatibility of devices which are prepared for reuse uh, that is not matching with the target groups. So I was once told a nice example in the city of Hong Kong, um, uh, where the uh, repair center um, CEO told me, well, look at my stock. It's full of nice 55-inch uh, TVs we have here, which is collected from the upper society, which is uh, keen on waste recycling. And the people who want to buy reuse items because it's cheaper, they just have a 10, 10 square meter flat, they can't put that screen in there or that TV in there. So uh, it's nice that we try to reuse, but the demand is not matching with the supply in this case. So what can we do uh, to foster reuse? That's uh, what we're here for. And uh, same uh, and even more, uh, uh, and there, I think there's even more ideas to uh, foster reuse and, uh, and, 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 and enable than we see obstacle, uh, obstacles. Um, starting with qualification on the right, uh, uh, clarifications on the right to repair with the OEMs as unfortunately OEMs that's what their nature is. They want to sell a new product and they are not uh, supporting the repair activities in many uh, circumstances. Um, uh, need to be convinced that uh, people are uh, allowed to repair a product and reuse it in some, in some uh, spaces or in some cases. Uh, this includes the availability of spare parts. Eco labels is a big measurement for end users uh, to give them the um, um, security if they buy a reused or repaired product that it meets certain quality standards. It is safe, the product. You can, uh, governments can think about VAT incentives. Um, the user should boycott single use devices. Eco design activities should be pushed forward. Standard, standardizing interfaces, and unified supplies or accessories uh, by eco design standards that's is a big thing. Um, new business models like renting versus buying, uh, buying is popping up. Uh, deposit fees on uh, ele electronic items and better batteries uh, could be implemented. Awareness raising campaigns are needed for the end user, for the population, which could start at school trainings to teach the kids and the youngest. Uh, you don't need to have the newest iPhone. Uh, you can have a, a, a refurb one as well, which is much cheaper. Um, quality uh, qualification of workers uh, could be supported, tax incentives given, and so on. Um, so there is many, many, many different um, um, approaches to foster reuse and prevention. And uh, especially uh, last but not least, um, um, looking into the new technologies and the big words, big data and artificial intelligence, there's a mass of projects going on to use the information you can uh, gain from online databases, uh, from online uh, trading platforms, and in the future, maybe from uh, device passports to feed artificial intelligence um, uh, devices um, to enable them to identify products and tell you exactly about the potential or at least the hazardous content uh, to put it for proper recycling. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Florian, for that very insightful presentation. A lot of suggestions what one could do to um, foster reuse uh, of electronic devices. I think there's yeah a lot we can take away from that. Um, so any questions for um, Florian, please put them in the chat and we'll pick them up in the end because due of time restrictions, I would like to move on to our last um, speaker today. I would like to welcome Josef Schweiger on the stage. He's um, yeah, working for Harvey Hydraulic, who is a manufacturing company in Germany. And they started like a very well-known initiative for um, yeah, zero waste in their own um, company. So Josef, please let us know what it's all about. Thank you. So hello everybody, my name is Joseph Schweiger and I'm 19 years old and the leader of the Zero Waste Project at Tavi Hydraulic. So first of all, I would like to say a few words to, about Tavi Hydraulic. So we are a German family-owned company that produces compact hydraulic valves and aggregates. 
we have 2,500 employees around the world, including one and a half thousand employees in Germany. Last year, we had a turnover of over 400 million euros. So why we started the zero waste project? We wanted and also want now to be more environmentally friendly. We started with the project called Zero Plastics, where we were looking to reduce single-use plastic in our company. One year later, we found out that single-use plastic is too limited. So we expanded to the project from zero plastics to zero waste, reduce, reuse, recycle. So I will start with some statistics about our zero waste project. At the moment, we have 30 implemented measures. We have over 400 kilograms of annual savings in single-use plastic. We are also networking as an important source for new ideas. We have 18.8 tons of new fiber cartons, which we have switched to recycled cartons. We have over 25 measures in planning or implementation. That's a lot because also because of our employees, which are giving to me a lot of ideas. We are also involved the trainees, which have our own sub-project called Free Nature. We have 24.5 tons of sorted out small load containers, which we gave to the recycler. And what's also very nice to see is we, that we also have a, a bit of a cost saving of around about 6,800 euros from the changeovers. So there we can also see um, saving, saving waste is not only saving waste, it's also saving a bit of money. In the middle, you can see our zero waste logo, where we have the three arrows, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Reduce, where we are looking to reduce our waste. Reuse, where we want to get away from single use to multiple use. And recycle, where on the one hand, we want to buy recycled materials. And on the other hand, we want to add the waste we produce to the recycling process. So let's go on with the zero waste network. In the network, we are considering all possible topics of resource wastage. We are learning zero waste best and bad practices from each other. We have exciting presentations from, ex from experts, for example, for, on packaging on demand, also on waste campaigns by the city of Munich and so on. And we are 11 participating companies. We are meeting us every six months. And so far we have over 41 tons of waste, which we have been saved in the, in the network. On the right side, you can also see the, the uh, participating companies. Um, we are the biggest company in, in the network and it's a very exciting because we have also companies like Tikiwi, for example, which are producing handbags and, and it's a one woman company. So there we have a, a lot, uh, a big difference, but also very nice um, to talk to each other and, and to network. Now I'm starting to show you some um, implemented measures. Um, for example, in the dispatch and the packaging material, um, we switched, um, I also talked about before, um, the, from new fiber paper to recycled paper. Um, there we had savings in the upper point of over 3,000 euros a year and have 12 tons of recycled paper now. Uh, down below, we have the pot pack paper. It's also a packaging material. Um, there we ha have a usage of 6.8 tons per year. And there we also switch from new fiber paper to recycled paper. At this point, we have 1,000 euros additional cost per year. But uh, as you can see, the 3, 000, over 3,000 euros uh, in the upper point. Uh, so that's no problem, these 1,000 euros. And if you don't know the advantages of recycled paper, um, up to 2.2 kilograms of wood can be saved per kilogram of recycled paper. So in our, in our case, that's over 40 tons of wood and recycling paper, um, it's also less um, electricity and water in, in the production. So in, in our case, we have 
uh, uh, electricity saving of 47 megawatt hours of ele electricity per year and also saving of water of, of over 600,000 liters a year. So let's go on to the next example. Here we tried a machine with cotton cord packing straps. Maybe you know these um, plastic packing straps normally uh, from the packages. And on the right side in the picture, you can see these cotton cord packing straps we tried. Um, we tested our, this, this machine in our plant in Fising, but in this case, the test wasn't successful. Um, the straps quickly became loose and our products are mostly too heavy for these too heavy for these packing straps. So um, maybe this machine is some, something for lighter products under five kilograms, but I think uh, when you have lighter products, you don't need to use these packing straps. Then we have some other measures, for example, the eco sprayer. Um, before we had these normal cleaners in our plants, um, we had a usage of over 150 plastic bottles per year. And now we have these eco sprayers. These are reusable bottles and ca that can easy, easily be refilled. Now we have one barrel with concentrate, and then you can refill, refill these eco sprayers with water and some concentrate. And so we have plastic savings of over 50 kilograms per year. Then we have this recycled, recycling of the sorted out uh, small load containers. Here we um, can recycle 1.5 tons per year around about. And of course, um, these containers, we're using them uh, multiple times, but when they go, get broken or um, are in bad condition, we are giving them to the recycler. We're using them a lot in the internal transportation. So internal transportation is all with, um, with, with these containers with multiple usage. And um, for this recycling, we also get some money around about 250 euros per ton. And maybe you are, you're wondering now, before I talked about over 24 tons we recycled of these containers, this is because of last year, we um, closed a smaller plant and the production of the plant and everything around it was moved to our largest and more modern plant, 10 kilometers away of it. And in this older plant, we had around about 20 tons of old and broken containers. And that is why we gave them to the recycler. Because of this, we didn't have to throw them away. Did something great for the environment and also got some money from the recycler. Then we have the copy paper. This measure is it isn't implemented yet, but we want to use recycling paper instead of fresh fiber paper. At the moment, we have a usage of 11.2 tons per year. That's a lot, but um, we the paper usage is getting less. Five years ago, for example, we had a paper usage of around about 16 tons. So we are getting there better and better too, but we also want to switch to recycling paper. And that's why we are testing it at the moment. Then we have uh, a big problem with our disposable coffee cups in the plants. Um, we have around about 1.2 tons uh, plastic waste every year from um, disposable coffee cups. And um, in our plant in Sachsenkamm, for example, we don't use this, uh, disposable coffee cups anymore. But if you um, for you, um, Sachsenkamm is our smallest plant, so there are uh, only 200 employees working and uh, the people wash their cups individually. And in Freising and Kaufbeuern, where 400, 700 people are working, this is a lot harder to handle. So we have to find a solution for this problem. And um, there is also um, our, um, our trainee um, project involved, the Free Nature project. And this will be the problem solver then. We call it the green clean. Um, with the green clean, it will be possible to clean a normal coffee cup within four seconds. We, with the clean nozzle, like you see on the picture. Our first prototype is already working. And at the moment we have a water consumption of 400 milliliters per cleaning. For example, a single use paper cup 
it's around about 500 milliliters of water in production. And I think the most employees will clean their normal coffee cup after work. So for example, when they are drinking free coffees a day, and after work, the, the coffee cup will be cleaned. We can save on about 1.1 liter against the free paper cups. And in the future, the clean clean should stand next to every coffee machine in our plants. So every employee will get his own coffee cup and every employee will be responsible for washing it himself. And at the end, we hopefully can save 1.2 tons of single-use plastic. So like you saw in my presentation, every company can do something. And not only every company, every single person can do something against waste pollution. And, then, and of course, I have to say, I'm not perfect. And also how hydraulic is not perfect. But we have started and we are getting better and better. Feel free to contact me and let us go this way together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Josef, for, for your insights into what you are doing as, as, a, as a company and how you're starting the initiative. That's very great to see. And um, yeah, I have one question directly for you um, because I think uh, it all kind of initiated a little bit from from uh, from the younger generation at, at Harvard, if I'm right. I'm not I'm not sure if I'm right, informed right here. But um, so what do you think? Why is it important to involve trainees and and the younger generation in into projects like this? So um, of course, we involve the, the younger um, the younger people to, to learn. And so they are the people who, who have to have to deal with the problems we have now. So so they have to deal the most. And so we, we wanted uh, firstly to involve the trainees, but it's also um, that they, uh, um, they have more time and can, for example, um, build this machine. And I, I uh, see in the chat you write uh, something from four minutes. Now uh, the green clean washes in four seconds. Okay, so wow. so that's, the, <laughs> the, that's the thing um, we wanted because when we have a normal washing machine, um, uh, some someone have to um, have to put the co coffee cups in it and uh, put it out and so on and so on and so we wash in four seconds and every employee can um, can put his coffee cup uh, in it and then washes in four seconds and put it out and then it's washed. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, I see we have some more questions in the chat and I would like to invite those people who asked the questions to open their camera and open their mic and to join us here in a little more interactive session. I see one question from, um, yeah, I think Christoph Janensch who wanted to, who asked uh, Florian Wertmann. I think it got answered in the chat, but maybe we can, yeah, share it with everyone. <laughs> A bit more interactive. I was wondering. So, if the OEMs, this is about the the e-waste um, presentation. So, um, if the OEMs produce products in a way that are single use by design, which is of course beneficial to them because consumers should buy new products probably once a year. People should get a new cell phone once a year, according to their logic. So, if um, yeah, so who should convince those uh, producers to, to change these product designs? Should it be the consumer? Um, and the, if we admit the consumer, the, the masses of the consumers usually choose the easiest way. Um, I know environmental con conscious people are of course uh, getting more and more very fast, but still many consumers will just, I don't know, will not probably change their behavior so easily. Uh, on the other hand, we have governments who can enforce laws, who can say, this is unsustainable. We, we make a law to force you to, to, to have a more sustainable product design. So what's your take on this? Should, should it be all left to the consumer or, should the, or, or to what extent should the government regulate this kind of product design? Thank you. Yeah, so thanks for the question. I think it, it, should, be, it should be starting um, uh, with, uh, with the consumer to a, at a certain point, as uh, the, the uh, government can, uh, can, cannot um, 
cannot dictate uh, dictate uh, to, to should not dictate to the consumer what to do what to buy so there should be an awareness um, um, uh, a re a risen awareness with the consumers what to do in those uh, they should change the demand so should start to, uh, to to show the OEMs we don't foster um, uh, this non-sustainable product lines anymore um, uh, on the one side so uh, to achieve this I think the governments should play uh, are playing a very very important role in the awareness raising campaigns and in education of the consumers which starts uh, out of my which should start out of my perspective already at school level as uh, we need to look at the long term at the long term angle um, in situations where um, uh, the OEMs do not listen to the consumers or do not change the behaviors or in 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 really in really bad in, in in situations where where um, um, uh, we we really have um, um, uh, yeah, OEMs that don't care, the government must um, implement some measurements like eco design directives, which is a tool to be used here. Uh, anyways, it is very difficult for governments to decide on those eco design directives as on the one side, they need to foster circularity and uh, environmental protection. On the other side, they should not harm product development and product design as that's not the role and of the government. And that's not the profession of the government. So if they do too much there, they could prevent uh, the development of uh, the products or, of the, or the, the improvement of the products. So this is a kind of the difficulty we're facing here out of my perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that. But maybe um, attached to that, what do you, um, don't you think that changing business models would also be, you know, of, of, a, of an interest of, of an O&M as well? In, like, instead of selling products to, to lend and re rent and lease them, couldn't that be like a, a valuable business model? Like for example, we saw with um, Lorenz, uh, the example Karina showed in her presentation, who actually had a win-win situation from changing their business model towards a more you know, leasing and using, like the use focusing the use perspective and not the selling and buying perspective. Um, it can be it can be uh, fruitful for the OEM, and it could be it could be an approach uh, to the situation. You see that, uh, for example, in Germany, uh, with uh, some uh, tool producers like uh, the Bosch company or like uh, like uh, Miele on household devices, who are changing more to a return pro uh, to a return model. Uh, we're taking um, um, items back. On the other side, uh, on the other side, um, um, for some OEMs, it's just interrupting their business models. They can't. Uh, can't really change. If you look for for printer cartridges, um, an OEM printer, uh, an OEM printer cartridge manufacturer, like for example Hewlett Packard, is making 90% uh, of their of their revenues on uh, on supplies. And if they change to uh, more sustainable supplies, um, um, uh, they just lose uh, the the core of their business. So um, definitely, changing of business models could be a chance for OEMs, and uh, they 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 should do. I think, but um, um, unfortunately, I think for some uh, some areas, it's just not possible. Uh, and again, uh, the business model needs to be endorsed by the produ by the pr producer and by the consumer. It's like mm. uh, there's still uh, still a lot of uh, still a lot of uh, questions if you go to just rent some device. You know, you you go to the you go to the store and you don't buy the the uh, the tool. You go there and make a contract, and then you pay a rent fee for the next one month, 12 months, 24 months, then you have to return it. Uh, it's not what people are used to. So um, it's necessary to have a rethinking on the consumer side as well on this. And uh, that's why, again, um, there must be some awareness raising for consumers, I think, uh, about the possibility of those uh, business models and uh, what effects uh, those uh, business models could bring for uh, the, the environment, for the circular economy and waste prevention. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's it's not only a, a big shift for, for, for companies, but also for every single person in society, a, a big mindset shift towards circular economy. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have two more questions in the chat. I'm not sure um, we are already kind of at the end of the, the session, but maybe we can pick one more. I think, uh, Alfred, if you want to repeat your question towards Josef, what was the most decisive prerequisite on your way to a zero waste manufacturer? So what was the most important step you took? 
So the most important step, uh, I think it was the beginning. So that we decided to start. Um, so I can, um, the starting wa was very easy for us because um, it came of, uh, of our chairman, Mr. Heusken. And uh, he, he came up and said he want to be more environmentally friendly. And then we, we, um, we uh, came to zero plastics and uh, wanted to be, to don't use um, single use plastic in our company. And then I already talked um, one year later, we um, then came to zero waste. Okay, so I guess the initiative of a single person within the company can already be the kickstart to to a very very long process towards even zero waste. That's yes, what I understood. Course. Yeah, perfect. Thank and, you so much. And ideally uh, uh, um, implemented by a very important person like Joseph yeah. said. Yeah, that, it's a that's from my point of view, it's a certain kind of mixture of a top down and a bottom up uh, essential. Uh, uh, going forward, uh, as I see it, especially in your company, Joseph, mm? yes. and that makes it very fruitful and success and successing. Thanks a lot. Yes, of mm? course. Mm? Thank you. Okay, perfect. So, um, as we are already at ten thirty-four, um, I would like to thank everyone on the panel every single person today who joined us and gave us their insights and their presentations and uh, yeah, giving us your time. Thank you very much for being present today. And uh, thank you very much, Christoph Jenens from the GIZ for uh, inviting us today to host this panel. It was a pleasure. And yeah, hopefully, um, yeah, I think we had all the contact details exchanged and you can see on the website, all the speakers again, if you wanna get in touch, feel free to get in touch with everyone. And yeah, we wish you a good rest of your afternoon and a great day for everyone else uh, back in Europe. Thank you. Yeah. Eva, thank you very much. Thanks for your moderation and also many thanks uh, for being part of this very interesting session. And uh, thank you to all our presenters. It was a pleasure to have you here. And yeah, thanks a lot. And I think uh, you underlined it uh, in your presentations. Too. We have a lot to do in the future. But all we do is purpose driven. And that's that's a good business. Thanks a lot for all the